There is an ideology that invisibly dominates almost every aspect of our society. It seeps into every nook and cranny it can find, from the cities to the countryside, from our jobs to our homes, from our schools to our political system, and even into our relationships with each other and with the planet. It burrows down into the deepest values we hold, such as freedom, dignity, and choice, and uses them to its own advantage. This ideology has gripped us so tightly that its logic has become intertwined in our own conventional wisdom. You may have never heard its name before, but this ideology is real, it is dangerous, and it is finally being exposed. This ideology is neoliberalism. What is neoliberalism? There are many ways to answer that question. You can call it a philosophy, a movement, a political project, or even a set of social values. In its most basic form, however, neoliberalism is an economic ideology that exists within the framework of capitalism. When observed at its philosophical origin, neoliberalism appears as an absolutist mantra that proclaims that a government or state must never intervene in any market or economy, even to provide welfare for its citizenry, lest it put society on a slippery path towards socialism and totalitarianism. The market, which is the wellspring of human freedom, must be allowed to operate free of any constraints or regulations. Anything less is to diminish the freedom of all human beings and place civilization in enormous peril. Practically speaking, neoliberalism refers to the various ways in which our society has elevated competition above all other conceptions of economic rationality, retasked the state with liberating competitive markets, and put increased responsibility onto the private individual to guarantee their own survival. Neoliberalism conceives of the world as one big interconnected competitive market, where human beings derive their freedom from their ability to express their preferences through consumption and represent their value through their ability to sell their labor for wages. Since all people enjoy equal access to and opportunity within this competitive market, inequality between winners and losers is permitted. And because neoliberalism asserts that there is an unbreakable link between economic and political freedom, neoliberalism seeks a world with unfettered economic freedom which would naturally guarantee political freedom for all. Therefore, according to neoliberalism, the predominant role of government should be to maximize economic freedom, no matter the cost. That might sound to you like a strange way to organize society, and you'd be right. But we live in a world that's been dominated by neoliberalism for close to four decades. Beginning in the late 1970s and early 1980s, most of the countries in the world transitioned from the old economic paradigm, one that had been operating mostly successfully since the late 1930s, to a new economic paradigm, specifically a neoliberal economic paradigm. This transition, sometimes referred to as the market turn, was no less than a revolution in economic and political thought and brought very dramatic changes to society. And yet, one of the most fascinating elements of neoliberalism is how its ideas, its rise, its ensuing power, and even its very existence are still unknown to most people today. Ask anyone you know, even someone who seems particularly attuned to politics or economics, and they will likely struggle to define neoliberalism for you or recall much of its history. In a society that's been neoliberal for as long as ours has, this is extraordinary. As a columnist of The Guardian, George Monbiot has astutely observed, living in the United States, the United Kingdom, or virtually any other country on earth without knowing what neoliberalism is, is akin to living in the Soviet Union without ever having heard of communism. You might still be fuzzy about what exactly neoliberalism is, but you have doubtlessly seen many examples of it in your own lifetime. Do you sometimes wonder why grocery stores often throw away food that could easily be given away to the hungry? Do you ever wonder why spikes on the ground are considered a solution to homelessness? Do you often wonder how it is possible to have incredible displays of wealth and opulence alongside abject and desperate poverty in the same community? And do you ever get the strange feeling that the economy, and by extension our roles as consumers, have been clandestinely placed at the center of our moral and political universes? If you do, then a close analysis of neoliberalism and its history will likely shed some insight into those nagging suspicions. In neoliberal societies, the only remedies to social problems considered politically palatable are the ones that rely on the market to deliver the solution, even if that solution doesn't actually solve the problem. The reason why excess food isn't given to the hungry is because the right of a private company to sell groceries at a profit is elevated higher than a vulnerable human beings need to eat. The reason why we place spikes on the ground to disperse homeless people is because we value the rights of property owners and businesses to be free of uncomfortable eyesores more than we care for the plight of property-less people. The solution for these vulnerable people, the argument goes, is to simply pull themselves up and engage in the market to get what they need. For the government to step in and provide affordable housing to the homeless 
or to give food to the needy, would be unfairly diverting profits from private businesses who only recognize humans as consumers. And the government can't be allowed to help the vulnerable, the argument goes, because to do so would inculcate dependency in the population and lead to greater and greater encroachments of the state. You can probably think of more examples of neoliberal capitalist logic the longer you try. Have you ever wondered why the idea of raising the minimum wage is so controversial? Because wages for workers and laborers are seen as a cost to be minimized, not as an investment in human prosperity or even as a basic requirement of doing business. Why is the idea of taxing the wealthy so controversial? Because neoliberalism asserts that people are wealthy because they simply work harder, work smarter, and are more virtuous. Taxation is seen as stealing from those who have earned and handing out to those who haven't, rather than as leveling a playing field that offers the well-off incredible opportunities to compound their wealth from the beginning of their lives. Why is the government viewed as a perpetual enemy of the market? Because the government's moral contract with its citizens enables it to regulate and restrict the market's ability to trade or speculate recklessly, thereby protecting consumers and limiting the potential profits of businesses. Why is the average American's default mode of transportation a personal vehicle instead of public transportation? Why don't we have universal health care? Or why don't we make internet connectivity a local utility? Why do we allow charter schools and private prisons to exist? Because companies don't want local or federal governments providing cheap, useful services that can be privatized and profited from instead. Why do the wealthiest individuals on the planet own more wealth than billions of other people? Why have the wages of working and middle class people stagnated for almost 40 years? Why are the costs of basic necessities and opportunities for social mobility rising out of attainability? And why are our political systems now approaching complete disorder and unresponsiveness at the same moment that corporate profits and wealth inequality are at their apex in recent history? These are all natural questions to ask in our neoliberal society. But for many of us, they're made taboo, or even imperceptible, by a normalized culture of economic absurdity that we've been immersed in for so long that we don't see anything out of the ordinary. The only way to break this spell is to re-examine our history, and recognize how we arrived at our contemporary moment. The rise of neoliberalism in recent history is at once a vast and overwhelmingly complex phenomenon, but also relatively easy to summarize the more you know about it. The problem is, most people have never even heard of the word neoliberalism. And without careful definition, it's even more difficult to see it in the world around you. And before we get started, no, this has nothing to do with partisan affiliation for one party or another. As we'll see, neoliberalism is a deeper framework for society that both major parties in the United States, liberals and conservatives, subscribe to to differing degrees. Let's start with the word neoliberalism itself. Neoliberalism simply means new liberalism which means there is also an old liberalism that we ought to be familiar with before moving forward. In the aftermath of World War II, the United States and its allies began the reconstruction of Europe and other parts of the world with a basic economic plan in mind. The emerging states would all turn towards liberal democracy, and their economies would focus on achieving full employment, economic growth, and the welfare of their citizens. The most important detail, however, was that state power would be used to intervene in, or in some cases completely substitute, markets. These policies were called Keynesian, named after the major British economist John Maynard Keynes. They rose to prominence in the 1930s following the Great Depression, and were the basic prescription for all liberal economies following World War II. The world before the Great Depression in many ways resembled the world today. Income inequality was high, the notorious robber barons enjoyed powerful monopolies over entire industries, and Wall Street was cashing in on the Gilded Age. But all of that came to an end in 1929, when the stock market crashed, and the entire world was subjected to an extended economic depression that changed global attitudes towards unregulated economies. What the Great Depression taught the world was that economic collapse caused by unregulated markets could destroy the chances for a better life promised by democratic society. Therefore, governments were forced, by popular discontent, to grapple with the issue of government-regulated economies, and turn to economists like Keynes for answers. Keynesian economic policies, represented by the New Deal under U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the development of robust welfare systems under Prime Minister Clement Attlee in the U.K., created the backbone of what most of us today consider a fair economy. The government would regulate markets by setting standards for wages, work hours, and welfare systems such as health care and education. In some cases, the government would break up monopolies or take over entire markets to prevent them from falling or becoming privatized. This was thought to be a class compromise between capital and labor, and was generally advocated as a necessity for domestic peace and tranquility. Capital, 
represented by the employers, the business leaders, and creditors, could still do business and make profits, while labor, represented by employees, workers, and consumer advocates, could lead prosperous lives thanks to their healthy wages, benefits, and social services. The other, more well-known half of liberalism was that society would be run democratically. Citizens would enjoy rights of free people, such as the right to speak and associate freely, to find dignified work, to elect representatives to public office, and to be free from arbitrary government oppression or corporate exploitation. This combination of liberal democracy with an economy monitored and regulated by the government is what is known as embedded liberalism, meaning that market and corporate activities are constrained by a web of regulation which prevents them from exploiting labor and acting recklessly in pursuit of profit. In the realm of politics, embedded liberalism was often referred to as the post-war consensus, referring to the way most countries in the world adopted embedded liberalism during the Reconstruction after World War II. In the United States, embedded liberalism came after the period of classical liberalism, which had a laissez-faire or leave-it-alone approach to the economy, and contributed to the conditions leading to the Great Depression. What makes neoliberalism the new liberalism, therefore, is that neoliberalism formally unshackles itself from the government regulations and interventions of embedded liberalism, unleashes the rapid expansion of markets and corporate activity, and undoes the Keynesian safeguard for labor, and with it, the basic guarantee of a decent life for many normal people. Neoliberalism is different from classical liberalism in that rather than simply taking a laissez-faire or do-nothing approach to the economy, Neoliberal states actively construct the policies and infrastructure necessary to create unregulated, free markets by design, markets which the government must create but never interfere with. Because neoliberalism is so opposed to government intervention in the market, neoliberals are sometimes referred to as libertarians, which is an umbrella term that encompasses varying degrees of skepticism towards the state's mandate to govern. Many of the early neoliberals were described as libertarians, conservatives, or even laissez-faire liberals, but the truth is that they were articulating a brand new framework for society that tasked the government with actively reorienting society around the market. As Daniel Stedman Jones has observed, the term neoliberal likely didn't catch on in our culture because it was lacking context. The terms liberal and conservative that we assign to our political parties today emerged out of the New Deal era, with supporters of the New Deal becoming liberal and opponents becoming conservative. The central confusion surrounding neoliberalism, then, is that the term itself appears to resemble liberalism, but in fact has much more in common with post-New Deal conservatism, in that neoliberalism is fundamentally opposed to the New Deal and in economic intervention by governments in general. Though neoliberalism initially found its home in the American and British conservative parties, neoliberalism would eventually dominate both the liberal and conservative parties in the US and the UK demonstrating the misleading nature of our traditional political labels and our collective failure to properly identify the neoliberal movement during its ascension. In this multi-part video series, we're going to trace the history of neoliberalism, starting with a close analysis of neoliberal thought and philosophy, a historical reconstruction of the movement pushing for neoliberal policy solutions, witnessing the damage that neoliberalism did to its first victims in the developing world, and then charting the infiltration of neoliberalism into the political systems of the United States and the United Kingdom. We'll then analyze how neoliberalism spread internationally and created the global political and social dysfunction we now find ourselves confronting. There are potential solutions to neoliberalism, but we can't understand what those are until we understand the history of neoliberalism itself. The origins of neoliberalism extend as far back as the late 1930s, and the success of neoliberalism was the fruit of decades of work by neoliberal academics and advocates in a group called the Mont Pelerin Society. From its inception, the Mont Pelerin Society sought to exert covert influence over society and achieve an unassailable neoliberal consensus in the academic and political arenas across the globe, making neoliberalism the invisible ideology that it is today. By producing mountains of neoliberal policy solutions through their transatlantic network of university departments and policy think tanks, these neoliberal thought leaders and businessmen, such as Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, Milton Friedman, George Stigler, James Buchanan, Anthony Fisher, Leonard Reed, Harold Luno, and many others laid the foundation for a counter-revolution against Keynesian embedded liberalism that finally came to fruition almost 50 years later. That neoliberalism completely displaced the post-war consensus by the late 80s is a testament to how committed these men were and how unprepared the rest of the world was.
Today, both the US and the UK are prime examples of neoliberal states in a late stage of their development. The neoliberal revolutions in these countries took place in the late 1970s and early 1980s, beginning in the administrations of Jimmy Carter in the US and James Callahan in the UK. In the midst of the stagflation crisis of the 1970s, Carter and Callahan both turned to monetary policies advocated by Mont Pelerin members such as Milton Friedman to reduce inflation and unemployment. Though neoliberalism found its first openings under the control of liberal parties, it was their conservative successors, Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan in the US, who took the neoliberal baton and ran so far with it that no administration since then has walked back the neoliberal consensus in either country. The unfortunate truth is that no one really tried to, either. The liberals who took power following Thatcher and Reagan, Tony Blair in the UK and Bill Clinton in the US, simply accepted the new normal of neoliberalism and abandoned their party's historic roles of protecting labor from capital and protecting society from monopoly power. This is why people often make the imprecise claim that both parties are the same. There are still many important differences between them, but enduring support for neoliberal economic policies is not one of them. The adoption of neoliberalism in powerful countries like the US and the UK influenced countries around the world to follow suit, making the path to neoliberalism in these two countries particularly crucial to understanding the spread of neoliberalism across the globe. But before neoliberalism was adopted in developed countries like the US and the UK, it was imposed by military force on developing countries such as Iran, Guatemala, Indonesia, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile in order to protect American business interests and to gather experimental data for neoliberal economists in the US to test their assertions. Military coups backed by the CIA took place in each of these countries, and the neoliberal economic policies which were adopted soon after were accompanied by the deaths, torture, and disappearances of hundreds of thousands of innocent people who were targeted for their political opposition to these regimes. When neoliberalism came to the developed world, there was no need for violent coups, but the resulting changes in society led to a different kind of oppression. Even when the suffering brought on by military dictatorship was taken out of the picture, neoliberal economic policies created suffering through the imposition of austerity, inequality, unemployment, incarceration, and poverty on normal people, and human needs for social solidarity and stability were submerged in a new world of ubiquitous competition, commodification, loneliness, and disconnectedness. The peaceful adoption of neoliberalism in the developed world didn't put an end to others being coerced into it, however. International lending bodies such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, created at the beginning of the post-war consensus, were converted to neoliberalism in the 1980s and subsequently began converting countries all over the world to neoliberalism through the process of structural adjustment policies in response to financial crises. Only recently has the IMF reconsidered its allegiance to neoliberalism after decades of touting its economic infallibility. But what exactly is neoliberal economic policy? How does it change or modify the economy and society? The economic route taken by neoliberal regimes is reflected in a policy playbook that's been seen reproduced around the world over and over again. Neoliberal economics, otherwise known as free market economics, relies on the simultaneous implementation of multiple different methods of economic shock treatment, as writer Naomi Klein calls it. Neoliberalism shifts the primary goal of economic policy from achieving full employment to the reduction of inflation and therefore pursues contractionary monetary policy over fiscal policy. These policies tightly control the supply of money being printed by the government in order to keep the real value of the currency high, to keep prices stable, to increase interest rates and therefore increase returns on loan repayments from debtors, and to deprive the government of money to spend on Keynesian interventions. Far from being a small technical detail, the shift from targeting full employment to inflation is what marks the death of embedded liberalism and the arrival of neoliberal regimes in almost every instance. Neoliberalism calls for deep budget cuts to government spending, even if that spending is devoted to crucial social services or welfare programs, which is also known as austerity. It also calls for the privatization of state-owned industries and services, which will later be privately operated or simply sold. It calls for the suspension of fixed price controls and exchange rates, the removal of tariff protections for local industries, and the suppression of labor's right to collectively bargain for improved work conditions. These goals are often accomplished with a combination of domestic legislation and international free trade deals such as NAFTA or the recently scrapped Trans-Pacific Partnership, which encode trade liberalization, the outsourcing of cheap labor, and corporate supremacy over government regulations into the DNA of their partner nations. Essentially, 
Neoliberalism calls for the removal of any regulations or legislation that impede the aspirations of multinational companies and corporations and of the politicians who inevitably benefit from serving them. The logistical purpose of these policies is to create a playground for private capital to invest in and profit from. Decreasing federal budgets for education, healthcare, and housing, and the accompanying privatization of those industries, forces people to pay private companies for crucial or even life-preserving services, companies that can easily raise the prices of these services and escape punishment for doing so. Removing tariffs means opening the economy to foreign investment and flooding the market with cheap foreign imports that crush local businesses, increasing unemployment and poverty, and sending money out of national circulation and into private pockets. Neoliberal economics also causes substantial growth in debt due to the combination of tax cuts and military spending, which are often two major priorities of neoliberal regimes, or the acceptance of structural adjustment loans from the World Bank or IMF, who then collect the loan repayment and interest from the national government, but not the private companies who spent the money. Fixed price controls, fixed exchange rates, and labor's ability to protest these conditions are obstacles to maximizing the returns on these investments, and so are removed. The practical result of these policies is an enormous redistribution of wealth from the public sector to the individuals and companies providing these new private markets who represent a convergence of corporate and political power. The line between politicians and wealthy business people is often blurred in late-stage neoliberal capitalist societies and can be accurately described as a power elite that views the population it is meant to serve as a captive and untapped market that can hold debt and risk but receives no relief in the form of government spending, bailouts, or basic compensation for labor. The military and police are strengthened, and then used to protect the power elite and their property if they experience resistance. And when these private interests are finished consolidating power, they begin to look for their next global target for deregulation and privatization. These measures are often justified by neoliberal thinkers for their effectiveness at decreasing inflation rates and rapidly increasing global growth and GDP output. But these measurements are not measurements of human flourishing, but merely of economic performance in a global economy that fewer and fewer people are participating in as time goes on. Some neoliberals even claim that their free market policies later led to the emergence of free society in historically oppressed countries around the world, or that the wealth of neoliberalism's primary beneficiaries trickles down to everyone else. And some even characterize the term neoliberalism itself as an epithet devoid of meaning or unrepresentative of neoliberalism's true form. These arguments are deceptive, and history has shown that neoliberals will suffer any human cost to defend the free market from government intervention, which they insist is the only source of human freedom there is. Today, the consequences of decades of neoliberalism in countries around the globe range from soaring inequality, devastating financial meltdowns, deepening political corruption, growing authoritarianism, and even amplification of the effects of climate change. In 2017, the richest 1% of the global population held 50.1% of the world's wealth, while the poorest 50% of the global population held just 1%. The global economy can be said to have technically recovered after the most recent financial crisis in 2008, but upon closer scrutiny it becomes apparent that the large majority of this recovery went to the wealthiest in our society, leaving vast numbers of people in financial precarity or outright poverty. Those responsible for the recession were not punished, but lavishly rewarded. These economic crises are now being compounded by political and cultural crises. Fascist and white nationalist organizing has been revitalized by people dispossessed by decades of neoliberal economics who have become susceptible to despair, hatred, and authoritarian sloganeering. These movements are given strength by cooperation with wealthy backers who use fascist movements as a vehicle for their own neoliberal policy goals, such as further tax cuts or deregulation. Our federal government, captured by private interests it is meant to regulate, is drowning in dark money and completely unresponsive to popular demands. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, who worked to preserve neoliberalism in the Democratic Party, helped create the necessary conditions for the election of Donald Trump, whose victory can be explained by, among many other factors, the failures of the Democratic Party to admit its complicity in the operation of neoliberalism and to construct a party platform explicitly opposed to it. While Trump and the Republicans are arguably more neoliberal than the Democrats, they were able to harness the populist tide born from disdain with the status quo that Clinton and the other neoliberal Democrats represented. Democratic Socialist challenger Bernie Sanders could have siphoned that support from Trump, but was denied by the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, which first flirted with neoliberalism all the way back in the Carter presidency, was left holding the bag of neoliberalism while the most scandalous candidate in history got away with the presidency.
In the absence of a strong and uncompromisingly pro-labor and anti-neoliberal alternative, national politics will continue to grow increasingly vicious and unhinged from reality. The standard neoliberal prescriptions of deregulation, privatization, austerity, and incarceration will continue unabated. Our new politics of xenophobia will produce more border walls, travel bans, deportations, gun violence, violent terrorism, racial and ethnic discrimination, and military aggression that will continue to weigh on the lives of everyday people. And global society will continue accelerating towards a world where fortresses of otherworldly wealth seclude themselves from vast wastes of decaying public spaces. And yet, all of these national crises distract us from still more perilous global crises. Earth's global temperatures and the rate of carbon concentration in the atmosphere are being exacerbated by runaway harvesting of enormously profitable yet non-renewable natural resources, threatening the long and short-term habitability of the planet. Rising sea levels threaten to trigger migration crises that will make Syria look like an opening act. On the approaching horizon, Technological advancements, such as automation and the development of powerful artificial intelligence, threaten to blindside societies still struggling with the ancient problems of inequality and poverty, rather than liberate us from our traditional lifestyles. The most frightening consequence of neoliberalism, however, is simply that as we continue to march further into this complicating and confusing morass of crises, unpredictable and unintended catastrophes will occur with greater and greater frequency. I intend to argue that all of these threatening conditions derive from the widespread acceptance of neoliberal economic thought across the world. But how could an ideology based on nothing but ensuring the dominance of markets over government come to envelop the entire world? This video series is the story of that transformation. This is neoliberalism. Neoliberalism was a reaction. It was an effort to disassemble a previous vision of society that once held sway over most of the world. In order to understand neoliberalism, it's important to first understand the world before neoliberalism, the world which neoliberalism considered unacceptable and in need of urgent reconfiguration. That world was the world formed by the post-war consensus, the world of embedded liberalism. Embedded liberalism, as we learned, describes the combination of a liberal democracy paired with a government that is empowered to intervene in a capitalist economy in order to achieve full employment, provide social safety nets or welfare systems for its citizens, sustain economic growth, and enact recovery measures in the event of economic recessions or depressions. In this form of liberalism, market forces are embedded in a social framework that compromises between the class interests of labor and capital in order to enhance human welfare. The bold idea behind this new social paradigm was that the government had a duty to protect its citizens and laborers from economic recessions, which could be caused by unregulated market activity. This was a major contributor to the global crash of markets in 1929, which led to the Great Depression and the impoverishment of millions of people around the world. The Great Depression signaled the end of a long period of economics based on the models of classical liberalism, which was the first economic paradigm to proclaim that markets are self-regulating and that markets should be free from any distortions, such as government intervention, in order to maximize efficiency. The theoretical framework behind this new approach to governance and economics was largely developed by John Maynard Keynes, a British economist who is now considered the father of modern macroeconomics. Keynes was an economic advisor to the American and British governments before and after World War II, who had an enormous impact on economic policy in the latter part of his life and for over three decades after his death. Keynes's written works sparked a revolution in economic thought that provided inspiration for the American and British responses to the Great Depression, such as the New Deal and the National Health Service. At the end of World War II, and in the last years of his life, Keynes represented Britain at the Bretton Woods Conference, where a new global economic system that standardized embedded liberalism was created. Keynes's economic prescriptions, which advocated using government spending to stimulate aggregate demand in order to reduce unemployment, undercut classical economics by showing how government intervention could helpfully mitigate the effects of economic downturns, and that free markets were not necessarily all that was required to achieve full employment and prosperity. Many who were still loyal to classical liberal theory found Keynes's work to be an affront to their traditional understanding of economics, and mistakenly considered Keynes and his followers to be in favor of overbearing and totalitarian governments that sought to constrain economic growth. It is for these reasons that the importance of understanding Keynes's works in service to understanding the eventual reaction to embedded liberalism by neoliberalism cannot be overstated. Truthfully, however, the nature of embedded liberalism is more complicating than this. Just as neoliberalism was born from embedded liberalism, embedded liberalism was spawned from historical trends which have origins all the way back at the turn of the 19th century. 
In order to better understand neoliberalism, we aren't just going to talk about embedded liberalism, we're also going to talk about the Industrial Revolution, the origins of markets, and the cycle of embedded and disembedded markets throughout history. But first, we're going to follow Keynes's enormous contributions to the development of embedded liberalism, analyze the embedded liberal era itself, and only then place embedded liberalism into a historical context that is far vaster than the era itself. Each of these steps will help us better understand how neoliberalism emerged from embedded liberalism while unlearning important lessons from history in the process. Let's start right before the Great Depression began. The year is 1929, in early September. World War I has been over for a decade. Stock markets are booming, and in America, the Roaring Twenties are still roaring, and some, such as the classical economist Irving Fisher, proclaim that stock prices had reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. That is, except for Roger Babson. Babson, a well-known business theorist of the time, famously predicted in a speech on September 5th that sooner or later a crash is coming, and it may be terrific. The initial market decline, which began later that month, was referred to as the Babson break. In late September, the London Stock Exchange crashed when it was discovered that a wealthy British investor named Clarence Hatchery and his associates had committed fraud and forgery in an attempt to finance a merger. On September 20th, all shares of companies associated with the Hatchery Group, which amounted to about 24 million pounds, which is equivalent to about 2.1 billion of today's dollars, were suspended. This had an immediately noticeable effect on global markets. Over in New York, a persistent feeling of uncertainty amongst stockholders set in after the London crash. For weeks, the volume of sales had been increasing to record-breaking heights due to increasingly frantic periods of selling, to the point that the ticker tape which relayed the stock prices to buyers was hours behind the time of sales. Then, at the nadir of the crash, uncertainty gave way to sheer panic. Between October 28th and 29th, which are remembered infamously as Black Monday and Black Tuesday, the stock market completely collapsed, and $30 billion of wealth simply disappeared on those two days alone. The stock market would not return to its pre-crash heights until 1954. The Wall Street crash of 1929 was not the singular cause of the Great Depression, but its arrival certainly unleashed the conditions of poverty, indebtedness, and misery on entire populations around the world. Countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Italy, Iceland, Chile, Bolivia, and Peru were all badly affected. Other countries fared better or worse, but few were relatively undisturbed by the Depression, with the exceptions of Spain, China, Russia, and Japan. In the United States, GDP fell about 30%, and the stock market lost almost 90% of its value between 1929 and 1933. The unemployment rate was 3% in 1929, but reached 23.6% in 1932, and peaked in early 1933 at 25%. Prices fell by 20%, causing deflation that made repaying debts much harder. Between 1929 and 1932, the income of the average American family was reduced by 40%, and 9 million savings accounts had been wiped out. By 1932, 273,000 families had been evicted from their homes, and by 1933, 9,490 out of 23,697 banks in the U.S. had failed. The Great Depression is still considered to be the worst economic recession the United States and many other countries around the world have ever endured. It was in this dismal moment that a diverse coalition of citizens, laborers, intellectuals, and politicians around the world began clamoring for solutions to the grave conditions facing huge numbers of people. Prior to 1932, President Herbert Hoover attempted several measures he believed would ameliorate the Depression, but few, if any, made things better. By the end of Hoover's presidency, his public image had deteriorated. Shanty towns and homeless encampments which had sprung up across the country were dubbed Hoovervilles, and the Republican Party as a whole was put on the back foot by a resurgent Democratic Party. In 1932, Hoover's re-election campaign for president was soundly defeated by Franklin Delano Roosevelt who would go on to not only spearhead the New Deal recovery programs, but preside over most of America's involvement in World War II, completely realigning American and global politics in the process. It was also during this period that the works of John Maynard Keynes completely shifted the mainstream economic consensus away from classical notions of free market equilibrium and towards the management of aggregate demand by active governments. In 1932, Keynes's reputation as one of the sharpest and most practical economic minds of the time already preceded him. Back in 1915, the British government had called upon Keynes to assist the government during World War I. 
where he developed and applied the system of Allied war loans. In 1919, he represented the British government at the Versailles Peace Conference, where he argued against the massive reparations imposed on the defeated German people by the other powers. After he was ignored, he published a book entitled Economic Consequences of the Peace, in which he correctly predicted that Germany would seek revenge for the economically crippling stipulations of the Versailles Treaty, leading to a war that would be even more deadly than the one recently concluded. In 1933, at the lowest lows of the Great Depression, Keynes published another book entitled The Means to Prosperity, in which he outlined specific policy proposals for tackling unemployment in a global recession. Though the book was primarily intended for the British government, copies of the book were sent to Roosevelt and other world leaders. Keynes then met Roosevelt face to face in 1934 while the first New Deal policies were being ratified. While at the time Keynes's ideas only had a marginal influence on U.S. economic policy, his very next work would shake the world of economics to its core and reveal the economic methods that would deliver prosperity for the entire post-war era. Keynes's landmark work, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, published in 1936, was the strongest theoretical justification for government intervention in the economy the world of economics had ever seen, and was a how-to guide for lifting economies out of recessions. Keynes began this work with the radical argument that the classical models of economics, on which he himself had been brought up, were in fact only applicable to a special case of circumstances while his own models constituted the general case. Keynes argued that aggregate demand was the most important variable determining economic activity, and that insufficient demand could lead to high unemployment, recessions, and depressions. Because people tend to save and hoard money during recessions, Keynes deduced that when savings exceed available investment opportunities, profits for business as a whole become impossible, and so layoffs and increased unemployment will result. Crucially, Keynes also challenged the classical idea that unregulated free markets would automatically provide full employment as long as laborers were flexible in their wage demands. He did this by introducing the concept of price stickiness, which was a recognition that in reality, workers often refuse to lower their wages below a certain threshold, even when a classical economist who believes supply always creates its own demand, famously known as Say's Law, might see that as a rational decision. Stimulating aggregate demand, with an acceptance of price stickiness, was a way of getting people to invest rather than save, which would create employment. Because of price stickiness, Keynes argued, the economy required state intervention in order to increase expenditures in either consumption or investment, which are the two components of aggregate demand. By stimulating demand through borrowing, deficit spending, and the creation of public works, the government could provide fiscal stimulus and increase employment, wages, and profitability for employers, lifting the economy out of recession and towards a point where the government could begin effectively repaying the debt it took on to fix the economy in the first place. Only when the economy had escaped the recession would the models of classical economics regain their relevance. Put into plain language, Keynes was simply saying that governments could escape recessions by creating a supply of work and wages for their citizens, increasing their ability to spend. If citizens could still work and earn wages despite the conditions of the recession, they would have money to consume goods and services or invest, which would help companies expand, keep hiring workers, and find new markets elsewhere. In this way, the government could prop up aggregate demand until the citizens' consumption and investment had returned to healthy levels. And one of Keynes's most notable accomplishments was his demonstration that in the absence of government expenditure, a country's economy could be trapped in a high unemployment equilibrium for an extended period of time. This was all a radical departure from the prior economic consensus, which held that government action was incapable of changing the level of employment. The general theory immediately ignited discussion and controversy in the realms of both academia and policy. It was extensively reviewed in journals and newspapers all around the world, and even its harshest critics had to acknowledge that it contained some novel insights. By 1939, only three years later, it was considered a revolutionary work that approached the impact of classical legends like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Governments around the world also took notice of Keynes's general theory. The very first government to adopt Keynesian demand management policies was Sweden in the 1930s. Of course, the most salient examples of Keynesian-inspired policies are the New Deal programs in the U.S., the British welfare systems developed under the Attlee government after 1945, and the international economic system developed at Bretton Woods that lasted all the way until the late 1970s and the arrival of neoliberalism. It is no exaggeration to say that without Keynes's general theory, there would have been no post-war consensus, and no period of embedded liberalism as we understand it today. While the very first of the New Deal plans were passed before the true advent of the Keynesian Revolution, many world leaders such as Roosevelt were already acquainted with Keynes's positions, 
as he had been arguing for public works as a means by which the government could stimulate the economy and tackle unemployment as early as 1924. Nevertheless, the intellectual case supporting the New Deal policies and interventionist policies in general was only strengthened over time by Keynes's general theory. The New Deal legislation, which was passed in two major phases throughout the 1930s, created dozens of new programs and administrative bodies in order to provide relief and recovery to struggling people and to reduce instability in the economy. This revolutionary period of activist governance, empowered to intervene in the economy, paved the way for the embedded liberal era that lifted the United States out of the Great Depression, into the rapid mobilization for World War II, and the unprecedented prosperity of the 50s and 60s. The initial array of new social programs, commonly referred to as the First New Deal, was passed between 1933 and 1934. President Roosevelt first attacked the weaknesses of the American banking and financial systems. These systems had contributed greatly to the severity of the crash and the resulting depression in several ways. It is commonly thought that the extraordinary heights of the stock market prior to the crash were inflated by millions of amateur stockholders engaging in speculation on prices. For this, the New Deal established the Securities and Exchange Commission to monitor financial activity and cut down on speculation. It also increased transparency on Wall Street by passing the Securities Act of 1933, which required the disclosures of balance sheets and other information about firms whose securities were traded. The first New Deal included the Banking Act of 1933, better known as Glass-Steagall, which separated commercial banks and securities firms, further discouraging banks from speculating and making risky investments themselves. Lastly, another large contributor to the severity of the Great Depression was the rate of bank failures caused by bank runs, or when large numbers of people withdraw their entire deposits. The first New Deal restructured and restricted the banking system by reopening and sometimes merging sound banks under the Treasury's supervision and ended the risk of bank runs by establishing the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. The first New Deal also put a large emphasis on relief for the poor and unemployed with a collection of new social programs. The Emergency Relief Administration provided money for relief operations in states and cities across the country. The Public Works Administration increased employment through the creation of public buildings, roads, bridges, schools, and airports, among other things. The National Recovery Administration created programs centered on establishing minimum wages and maximum work weeks for specific industries. And President Roosevelt personally considered the health of the agricultural industry to be paramount to recovery, and created many organizations for the sole purpose of reinvigorating the profitability of farm production. The Second New Deal, which ran from 1935 to 1938, contained even more dramatic and controversial programs. It included the Social Security Act, which created the framework for the entire U.S. welfare system that we still use today. Before Social Security, only one state in the entire United States, Wisconsin, had an old age insurance program. Once the Social Security Act was passed, it established a permanent system of universal retirement pensions, unemployment insurance, and welfare benefits that had never existed in the U.S. before. Though the Social Security Act was rather conservative by European standards, it was a transformative institution for American society that remains integral to the health of many Americans today. The Second New Deal also took the health and security of laborers very seriously. It included the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, also known as the Wagner Act, which protected labor organizing by allowing workers to collectively bargain through unionization. The immediate result was a tremendous growth in membership of newly empowered labor unions who could effectively bargain for improved work conditions. The Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 set a maximum of 44 work hours per week, established a minimum wage, and forbid child labor of children under the age of 16, while children under 18 years old were barred from working in hazardous environments. The New Deal was sprawling and ambitious in scale, but arguably didn't fully embody Keynesian thinking. Roosevelt and the other New Dealers didn't believe in deficit spending, and preferred balanced budgets instead. But this changed with the onset of World War II. The start of the war coincided with the ascendancy of Keynesian economics in mainstream thought, and so at last Roosevelt and the New Dealers turned to Keynesian deficit spending as they prepared to enter the war. Massive borrowing by the government to spend on the war effort was the last nail in the Great Depression's coffin. By paying factories and companies up front to aggressively recruit anyone they could find to manufacture weapons and tools for the war, the U.S. finally reached full employment for the first time since the beginning of the Great Depression. The federal military budget soared, completely eclipsing the New Deal programs by 1941. Keynesianism had worked, but it was war that twisted the government's arm to finally embrace Keynesian deficit spending, not its social programs. In the midst of the war, in 1942, 
another British economist named William Beveridge formulated a plan for a more comprehensive welfare state in Britain with Keynesian and New Deal overtones. His influential report, Social Insurance and Allied Services, called for a national health service, a national insurance contribution, and a 3% unemployment target. Beveridge argued to his skeptics that welfare institutions would increase the competitiveness of British industry by shifting labor costs such as health care and pensions out of the private sector and into the public sector. He also observed that a healthier and wealthier population would naturally be more motivated and productive and capable of stimulating demand. Only three years later, Clement Attlee defeated Winston Churchill for prime minister in 1945 on a platform of reform policies inspired by Keynes and Beveridge leading to the Labour Party's biggest victory in their history and the creation of the National Health Service, among many other popular welfare and housing programs. Though Roosevelt had already died by the time Attlee took power, Keynesian economic policy had taken root in the Western world and planted the seeds of the international post-war consensus. Before the eventual defeat of the Axis powers in 1945, the Allied forces were already discussing amongst themselves how to rebuild and restructure the world along their lines. In 1944, Keynes represented the United Kingdom in the international negotiations at the Bretton Woods Conference, a large-scale negotiation that would have an immeasurable impact on the political and economic stability of the post-war world. It was at this crucial gathering that the components of global embedded liberal policy were formally established. At its core, embedded liberalism was an era born from enormous tragedies, one being the Great Depression and the other being two world wars. The architects of embedded liberalism, such as Keynes, sought to construct a world that was much more economically and politically stable than the tumultuous decades that had preceded it. The means of achieving this stability was to balance two somewhat conflicting objectives. The first was to allow national governments to provide generous welfare programs for their citizens and to intervene in their economies to maintain full employment. This was the style of economics that Keynes had introduced in response to the Great Depression. Developed countries around the world now agreed that any successful international economic system would have to assure that governments could still pursue domestic stability, employment, and growth without allowing domestic goals to be dislocated by global shocks. The second objective was the resuscitation of an international trading system that would boost global GDP. Before World War I, accommodating and participating in an international trading system managed by the gold standard system was the foremost objective of most national governments. Unfortunately, the First World War, the Depression, and the Second World War each badly damaged that global trading system. During the Depression, countries raised barriers to trade in attempts to keep their failing economies afloat, leading to the devaluation of national currencies, the inflammation of political tensions, and the deterioration of world trade. However, had the world simply returned to the pre-World War I system of global trade, the accomplishment of the first objective would likely become impossible, because in an unrestricted free market for international capital, such as was the case prior to World War I, investors could easily withdraw money from the nations that attempted to implement interventionist or redistributive policies and reinvest it in countries that lacked such policies. Also, the Bretton Woods representatives were keen to avoid another Treaty of Versailles situation, where unrealistic and unsustainable economic expectations were imposed on countries that could not satisfy those requirements engendering balance of payment crises and the spread of reactionary movements. This was a possibility Keynes was all too aware of. In July 1944, 730 delegates from the 44 Allied nations met at the Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. It was there that they deliberated for close to a month about how to balance the needs of the post-war world. The two major influencers present at the conference were Keynes, the British delegate, and Harry Dexter White, representing the U.S. The conference was mainly devoted to settling the details of two major projects. The first was the creation of the International Monetary Fund, which would maintain an adjustable foreign exchange market rate system that was pegged to gold. The second was the creation of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, better known today as the World Bank, whose purpose was to speed global reconstruction after World War II, mostly by lending for large infrastructure projects. It was with these two international bodies, working in tandem with national governments, that the Bretton Woods representatives aimed to arrive at the compromise necessary for the post-war world. The IMF's system of fixed exchange rates would tightly control the values of currencies, ensure sound balances of payment between trading nations, and blunt the negative effects of speculative financial capital flows into the realm of domestic policy. On the other hand, the IBRD would help rebuild society by lending out funds paid into the bank through subscriptions paid by member states in gold and national currencies.
the functions of these two organizations were combined with national governments that were permitted to maintain capital controls on the flow of capital into their capital accounts, preventing damaging flights or influxes of capital. These were the basic criteria on which all of the Bretton Woods representatives agreed. In the course of the conference, however, Keynes proposed another ambitious institution for the new economic order, which he called the International Clearing Union. Keynes argued that the ICU would be a bank that could print its own currency, called the Bancor, which would be exchangeable for national currencies at a fixed rate. This would provide nations a unit for measuring their trade deficits or surpluses with each other. Keynes thought that this would be a solution for countries with trade deficits that were unable to overcome their debts, therefore stifling economic growth on a global scale. In a sense, Keynes was advocating for an international economic government that could act as a mediator between countries with asymmetrical trading situations, allowing debtor countries and creditor countries to quickly balance each other out without any global economic slowdown or simmering political tensions. However, the American delegate, White, adamantly refused Keynes's proposal. Instead, White insisted that the Bretton Woods system use the US dollar as its reserve currency with optional convertibility into gold. White viewed the IMF's role as closer to a conventional bank, which made sure that borrowing states would repay their debts on time. As the representative of the world's largest creditor and the holder of two-thirds of the world's gold supply, White was securing very favorable conditions for the U.S. with his plan. And because it would inevitably be the U.S. that would be supplying most of the credit to this new international system, White's influence on this matter prevailed over Keynes's experimental cooperative system. Despite the fact that Keynes's proposal was refused, he was still satisfied with the results of Bretton Woods, saying that if the institutions stayed true to their founding principles, the brotherhood of man will have become more than a phrase. Keynes, whose health had been seriously compromised by a series of heart attacks in the last years of his life, died in 1946 at the age of 62. It was only upon his death that the era of embedded liberalism, the era that would reap the benefits of his economic ideas, was truly born. After Bretton Woods, the United States, the United Kingdom, and most of the rest of the world formally turned to embedded liberalism in order to finance the reconstruction of their societies and guarantee the well-being of future generations. And for a time, this succeeded. The era of embedded liberalism lasted from roughly 1945 to 1979, only 34 years, but was one of the most uniquely prosperous and stable periods in human history. It is frequently referred to by historians as the golden age of capitalism. But what was it that made embedded liberalism so good? On the macroeconomic scale, the economic growth and health experienced during this period was unprecedented. World real GDP growth averaged 4.8% for the entire period, and never once dipped lower than 3% between 1951 and 1973, which essentially means that there was not a single recession during that entire time. Unemployment levels were consistently kept at historically low rates, fulfilling the major promise of the embedded liberal compromise. Economic volatility, which can have a negative effect on GDP growth, was also consistently kept low, reducing uncertainty about future trends. Inflation was kept low, at an average of 3.9%, until the stagflation of the 1970s appeared. Income inequality was also much lower than it is today, both globally and within individual countries, offering a world with less political corruption and social stratification. Politically speaking, this was the era of the post-war consensus. Developed countries all over the world shifted their focus to full employment, strong trade unions, nationalization of weak industries, educational reform, heavy regulations, high taxes, and generous welfare states. And with the International Bretton Woods Agreement in place, the system of fixed exchange rates would guard against the deflation, currency speculation, and economic barriers that caused the economic turmoil and inflamed political tensions of the 1920s and 30s. Tariffs were lowered, and economic cooperation was pursued to the utmost degree unless it impacted domestic legislation. Of course, the United States was the prime mover behind the world economy thanks to White's maneuvering, but the U.S. played this role ably, injecting huge amounts of recovery funds into worldwide reconstruction through the Bretton Woods institutions and the Marshall Plan. This new economic and political reality did improve the lives of everyday people. The embedded liberal era was a great time to be alive in almost any developed country. Housing and education were cheap, especially for returning American soldiers entitled to GI Bill benefits. Stable, long-term employment was plentiful. Labor unions were strong, and the rights of laborers were vigorously defended. Social mobility was real and attainable for middle-class families and immigrants from poor nations across the world. The stock market recovered to levels not seen since 1929. 
Tax rates were much higher for the richest members of society, reducing inequality, and providing the government with funds to spend on public works or welfare programs in Keynesian fashion. And thanks to the fact that the average citizen was better protected from poverty under embedded liberalism, sustained participation in important social movements became more possible than ever. This isn't to say that the period was completely perfect. War and terrorism still existed. Political corruption and anti-intellectualism still occurred. Certain members of society were still excluded from political enfranchisement and material prosperity based on their race, gender, or sexual orientation. And an entire generation was born into this post-war era who would take the hard-fought and highly anomalous prosperity of this era for granted, while doing almost nothing to protect it against forces that were patiently waiting for its demise. Embedded liberalism, as a whole, was an extraordinary period in history, and one that only becomes more relevant when attempting to dissect neoliberalism. As we'll see in future episodes, the path to neoliberalism was paved by the systematic dismantling of the accomplishments of the embedded liberal era. Keynesianism's reputation as a dependable economic approach was diminished. Society's trust in government to enhance freedom through intervention was replaced by intense suspicion of big government meddling. And the mechanics of the Bretton Woods post-war consensus, including the fixed exchange rate system and national capital controls, were discarded in favor of floating exchange rates and rapid financial globalization. But in order to prepare ourselves for future episodes devoted solely to aspects of neoliberalism, we must first go one step further in our understanding of embedded liberalism conceptually, and the true nature of embedded liberalism, and of the concept of embeddedness in general, is still more complicating than this summary. So far, we've only talked about embedded liberalism in the context of the Keynesian reforms of the 20th century. But the actual origin of the term embedded liberalism is a patchwork of different authors and influences that coalesces into a powerful descriptor of certain historical trends. Ironically, the phrase embedded liberalism itself wasn't coined until 1982, which is shortly after the neoliberal revolution. It was first used by a scholar named John Gerard Ruge in an analysis of the post-war economic order. However, Ruge states that he himself borrowed the concept of embeddedness from Karl Polanyi, a Hungarian-American socialist philosopher. It is from Polanyi's major work, The Great Transformation, from 1944, that the term embeddedness was taken to describe embedded liberalism. Polanyi's concept of embeddedness is much more nuanced than what we've discussed thus far. An understanding of Polanyi's writing informs us that, in fact, the transition from classical free market liberalism to embedded liberalism is just one phase of a cycle that has roots all the way back at the dawn of industrialization in England. Polanyi argues that until the turn of the 19th century, markets, wherever they existed, had always been embedded in society. They were subordinated by social relations, by religious institutions, by traditions of reciprocity, gift-giving, and redistribution of resources. Markets were means through which existing social relationships and norms were expressed, and were not ends in and of themselves. When industrialization rapidly emerged in England, classical English thinkers responded to its disruptions by crafting the very first theory of market liberalism, with the core belief that human society should be subordinated to self-regulating markets. These beliefs, that markets are self-regulating and exist outside of society, quickly spread across the world along with industrial capitalism itself. This was the moment in which the market ceased being embedded in society and for the first time in human history became an entity separate from society, to which society was meant to be subordinated. Polanyi identifies this moment as 1834, with the passage of legislation in England that created the very first markets for labor. From this point on, labor, land, and money were converted into commodities to be bought and sold at market prices. Polanyi calls these commodities fictitious, because he believed it was evident that these things, man, nature, and mediums of exchange, were obviously not created to be bought and sold on a market, and that commodifying these things would push both man and nature to the precipice of annihilation. An important part of Polanyi's stance is that attempting to completely disembed markets from society was harmful, but also impossible, a utopian project. Harmful because he believed human beings should never be commodified and subjected to the impersonal logic of a market, and impossible because society would inevitably protect itself, either consciously or unconsciously, from the dangers posed by self-regulating market societies. This urge of society to protect itself from the advancing march of the self-regulating market is what Polanyi called the double movement. In the Polanyian account, the catastrophes of the early 20th century that embedded liberalism was emerging from, the Great Depression and the World Wars, were violent expressions of the unconscious double movement reacting to the attempt 
to organize the global economy on the basis of disembedded markets anchored to the gold standard system. Polanyi saw World War I as the result of tensions between imperial powers rushing to colonize the world in competition for valuable natural resources that would make their home countries financially solvent under their rigid gold standard system. World War II was the moment that self-regulating markets and democracy both failed to protect society, allowing fascism to fill the void. In both cases, society underwent massive convulsions in the form of global conflicts and depressions as reactions to the disembedding of markets that had occurred a hundred years earlier. The double movement is a powerful explanation for the rise of embedded liberalism. Once World War II had concluded, markets were, for the first time since 1834, after 111 years, re-embedded in society with the help of Keynesian economic policies. Keynesianism, in a way, was a recognition that there is no way the government can possibly abstain from the management of the fictitious commodities without incurring financial chaos and widespread human suffering. The double movement had successfully reverted markets to an embedded liberal position by legitimizing government intervention in the self-regulating market. The needs of humanity had finally begun to reassert themselves over the needs of the market. But this was a short-lived victory for defenders of society. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, markets were once again disembedded under the administrations of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, who represented the market forces at the opposite pole of the double movement. This is the period of neoliberalism, which is in fact the second period of market disembeddedness in human history, the period we are still living in today. Neoliberalism might have been a reaction against embedded liberalism, but the truth is that the feud that defines our times is not simply between the neoliberal version of capitalism and the embedded version of it. The truth is that the fundamental conflict at the heart of the neoliberal crisis is between the idea of a disembedded market, which is now protected by market-captured governments under neoliberalism, and the rest of human society. With Polanyi's concept of embeddedness in hand, the importance of Keynes is revealed to be not simply that he helped create embedded liberalism, but that he helped re-embed markets back into the fabric of human society, and remove the self-regulating market from a position of supremacy over humankind, if only temporarily. But there was another man who wanted to dominate economic thought like Keynes did, who stood in Keynes's shadow throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, slowly building the arsenal for his counter-revolution all the while. The origin of neoliberalism, of the reaction to Keynesian state intervention, and the real beginning of our story is found in the work of one man, Friedrich August von Hayek. The story of neoliberalism is a story about the power of ideas. Our world, and we who live in it, are at every moment of our histories being guided and directed by ideas which we might or might not consciously recognize. We rely on our upbringings, our educations, our experiences, and our collaborations with each other to create a version of reality that seems cohesive and meaningful to us. But inevitably, our conceptions of the world become colored by the dominant organizing principles of society, whether we perceive them or not. Thankfully, as time goes on, even our most closely held beliefs about what the world is and how the world should be change. At the conclusion of World War II, the ideas which dominated social, political, and economic life were those that pursued global peace, stability, and compromise between social classes within a capitalist society. These ideas were born out of titanic struggles against economic depressions and vicious fascist regimes, which proved incontrovertibly that the ideas which previously ruled the world had guided it frighteningly astray. There was an overwhelming cry for a new set of ideas to guide the world, ideas that focused on achieving human flourishing through the tactful use of government intervention in the economy. John Maynard Keynes was the primary author responsible for bringing these new ideas into the world. His general theory smashed the laissez-faire consensus of classical liberalism by demonstrating the power that active governments had in protecting people from the dangers of severe depressions, and even from global conflicts that were born from economic chaos. But beyond his theories themselves, Keynes lifted the already vital importance of sound economic policy to dizzying new heights. Regardless of what economic policies one believed were the correct ones, it was evident to all that economic ideas were now the realm in which true power over the course of history resided. Embedded liberalism was not the first global economic paradigm to assume this power over world events, but the shift to embedded liberalism marked one of the most deliberate and dramatic global transitions in human history. The unquestionable logic of self-regulating capitalist markets under classical liberalism had been subordinated to a compromise between the ambitions of capital and the security of laborers 
people expected their governments to protect them from hunger, disease, impoverishment, and squalor, even if it meant intervening in the market's ability to generate profit. For much of the world, it was an enormous victory for humanistic ideals of liberty, justice, and equity that had been gaining ground since the Enlightenment, but for some others, it was an insufferable defeat that would not go unanswered. Embedded liberalism was in power, but it was not without resistance. Thinkers and economists loyal to classical liberalism and laissez-faire capitalism had been politically refuted. Their worldviews had been confounded by the Great Depression, and they now had to reconcile their lives' works with their stunning rebuke by Keynes. Meanwhile, the agents of business and capital, including the American opponents of the New Deal and British opponents of Clement Attlee's British reforms, were only begrudgingly accepting of the situation at best, or on the warpath against intervention at worst. These two factions saw only danger and incompetence in the ideas of those like Keynes, who would empower governments to stifle private individuals and companies from realizing their economic potential, and imbue them with totalitarian ambitions of planning all aspects of society. But rather than help refine embedded liberalism to achieve a better balance between regulation and competition, these two factions allied with one another to create an idea so powerful it would covertly undo their losses to embedded liberalism by supplanting it entirely. But before we excavate the prehistory of neoliberalism, it's important to recognize the crucial fact that neoliberalism was different at its origin than it is today. It morphed through intellectual and political phases over time, sometimes deliberately, and sometimes by unconsciously conforming to the available political landscape. There are, in fact, four distinct phases of neoliberalism, all of which will be covered by this series. The first phase of neoliberalism took place in Europe between 1918 and 1950. The conclusion of the First World War was the moment that classical liberals were forced to concede that there existed pernicious instability within laissez-faire market societies. The Great Depression of 1929 was the second blow to classical liberalism, and created a crisis of market legitimacy that necessitated liberalism's rehabilitation. Owing to Keynes's general theory, early neoliberal thinkers reformulated classical liberalism by acknowledging the need for a strong state. But there was a less than monolithic consensus about what exactly this new liberalism would be. Early divergences occurred within new liberal thought and actually produced different strains of neoliberalism, such as the German ordo liberalism, which valued social welfare and anti monopoly regulation highly, and the more libertarian variant of neoliberalism originating with the Austrian School of Economics, which stressed the preservation of a competitive order through the rule of law. Over time, however, a coalition of neoliberal thinkers from Austria, France, Germany, England, and America coalesced around the goals of protecting individualism and free market competition from what they perceived to be different shades of dangerous collectivism spreading over the world. Neoliberalism targeted an incredibly broad spectrum of enemies, ranging from moderate Keynesian liberals and progressive reformers to socialists, Marxists, and communist Bolsheviks, all of whom, they believed, would invariably deliver the world to totalitarianism. This period was capped by the creation of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947, a closed debating society organized by Friedrich Hayek, which convened its very first meeting on this day, April 1st, 72 years ago. The Mont Pelerin Society laid the groundwork for a highly organized and well-financed front against all forms of government intervention, but especially Keynesian embedded liberalism. Keynes's death in 1946 and the fervent anti-communist air of the Cold War provided fertile ground for neoliberalism to grow in the shadow of embedded liberalism. The second phase of neoliberalism took place in America and Europe between 1950 and 1980. This phase was marked by several developments in neoliberal thought and organization. Close partnership between neoliberal academics and wealthy corporate backers enabled potent neoliberal ideas to emanate from prestigious university economics departments, especially in Chicago. These same corporate backers also weaponized a new political institution, dubbed the think tank, which pushed the research produced by these neoliberal economists and supplemented it with mountains of their own neoliberal policies and critiques from outside of academia that were intended for use by journalists and politicians. It was also during this era that neoliberalism shed all of the few social elements contained in its earlier forms, including anti-monopoly regulation and social safety nets, in favor of treating corporate monopolies as benign, seeking deregulation of all government functions and private industries, and relentlessly eroding the power of labor unions. This newer, more aggressive strain of neoliberalism was laser-focused on accumulating intellectual and scientific legitimacy, which provided cover for its frequent collaborations with right-wing dictators, especially in Latin America. This era included the creation of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1968, a prize that was conceived for the express purpose of raising the profile of neoliberal economics. 
It also included the Pinochet coup in Chile in 1973, a CIA-backed coup aided by neoliberal Chilean economists trained by Montpellier members. This era culminated in the global stagflation crisis of the 1970s, which provided the opening for neoliberalism to crack the Keynesian consensus and propel Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan to victory. The third phase of neoliberalism constitutes the actual neoliberal revolution, which took place all over the world between 1980 and 2008. Thatcher and Reagan each aggressively initiated neoliberal policies in the US and the UK, and then globally through the conversions of the post-war institutions, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, into neoliberal organizations that spread neoliberalism through the structural adjustment policies imposed on financially struggling countries. It was during this era that the accomplishments of embedded liberalism began to be stripped away. The rates of unemployment, poverty, productivity, corporate profits, wealth inequality, incarceration, and military spending began to climb, while tax rates for the top income tax bracket were slashed, and wages for everyday people began to stagnate. The Bretton Woods international monetary system eventually collapsed, creating the possibility for rapid financial globalization across national borders to occur. It was also during this phase that neoliberalism not only spread over the world, but took on idiosyncratic attributes of its home countries. At first, American neoliberalism fused neoliberal antipathy towards regulation, welfare, unions, and taxes with the radical evangelical Christian cultural politics found in the conservative Republican Party, which campaigned against non-white immigration, abortion, gun laws, gay marriage, and the teaching of evolution in public schools. Tragically, the crushing defeats that liberal parties suffered in the US and the UK at the hands of Thatcher and Reagan influenced them to walk away from their accomplishments under embedded liberalism and adopt neoliberalism instead. Rather than recommit to the ideas that made liberal parties the architects of the great 20th century prosperity, new Democrats such as Bill Clinton began to triangulate between what they perceived to be the positions of their centrist Democratic base and a radically right-wing Republican base, with the intention being the recapture of a wide swath of the voting population for Democrats. But this only resulted in a distinct shift of the Overton window to the right. Contrasting with the Republican brand, the Democratic brand of neoliberalism combined the same blind faith in the virtues of markets with reverence for technocracy, meritocracy, elite education, and professional expertise. This made them easy marks for an ideology obsessed with accumulating status and prestige, and induced them to abandon their historic working-class voter base in pursuit of a mythical professional-class voter who was seeking a midpoint between Republican madness and muddled liberal corporatism. Democrats would provide the counterbalance on social issues like gay marriage and abortion, but would reliably fold when presented with opportunities to oppose deregulation, wealth concentration, and military adventurism. The same thing happened in the UK, where the new Labour Party under Tony Blair entrenched and extended the accomplishments of the Thatcherite Conservative Party. The cumulative result of this era was a sleepwalking descent into ubiquitous political and economic misdirection. The United States now had two major political parties that battled fiercely within the narrow space permitted by neoliberal market perspectives, whose traditional labels of liberal and conservative no longer had any meaning. The American public ironically became increasingly partisan in a time when both parties had seemingly developed two styles of the same political ideology, which isolated any who called for government intervention in the economy and especially the dismantling of dangerous concentrations of wealth and power. The fourth phase of neoliberalism extends from the 2008 global financial crisis until today. In 2008, the consequences of decades of neoliberal hegemony were made stark and apparent to the entire globe. Market forces had once again devastated the world economy through reckless corporate activity, just as in the Wall Street crash in the Great Depression. But this time, there was no transition to a new economic paradigm. This is mostly because of the failures of President Barack Obama and the enduring influence of neoliberalism in the Democratic Party. When President Obama took office in 2009, he had the strongest mandate to completely realign politics towards a new economic system that any president had enjoyed since Ronald Reagan he could have begun the slow but necessary transition away from the neoliberalism that had characterized the previous three decades, but squandered that opportunity almost entirely. Of course, it would be remiss not to mention that Obama was standing in opposition to the Republicans, a group so virulently neoliberal and anti-intellectual that they can claim most of America's political deterioration for themselves. Nevertheless, the remedies to the crisis that were approved by Obama included only stimulus packages that were insufficient to undo the harm experienced by the public, and did not include punishment for the corporate recklessness that obviously induced the crisis. The major perpetrators walked away virtually unscathed and billions of dollars richer. Neoliberalism was permitted to live on as a zombie paradigm, with its corruption and lawlessness made plain for all to see. The mirage of stability and recovery that the world experienced under Obama 
only served to mask the economic precarity under which the average citizen of the developed world was now living, and was a fitting prelude to the violent but predictable lurch to authoritarianism under Trump, who is both fascist and neoliberal. Trump expertly harnessed the disgust born from neoliberal decay by positioning himself outside of the political establishment, but in fascist style, scapegoated immigrants, all while providing an easy entrance for the most sadistic neoliberal forces in the country to further dominate the government. The Democrats could have capitalized on this populist moment themselves by returning to their legacy as the defenders of labor from capital and savagely attacking their opponent's neoliberal agenda. But instead, they blundered by nominating an arch-neoliberal who is indelibly stained with the image of a dismal manager of the status quo. Against a populist authoritarian, she was a dead candidate walking. The Democrats therefore continued a long trend of losing to increasingly dangerous Republican neoliberals by refusing to reject their own weaker brand of neoliberalism. In the same way that liberals post-Reagan conceded political ground to the right, they continue to do so today by clinging to their faith in neoliberalism to deliver electoral success and by refusing to embrace their left flank. We now turn to the first phase of neoliberalism, the phase from 1918 to 1950, in which free market capitalist thinkers were compelled to devise a new liberalism that overcame the pitfalls of the Great Depression and fought back against the powerful ideas of Keynesian liberals and socialist central planning theorists. Friedrich Hayek became the grandfather of the global neoliberal movement and ignited the greatest intellectual counter-revolution in modern history. Neoliberalism's gradual ascent and then complete takeover of society is a complex, sordid, and in many ways ironic story. But most importantly, it was far from inevitable, and it's a story that needs to be told if we're to deeply understand the circumstances in which we find ourselves today. Though Hayek spent much of the 20th century in Keynes' shadow, the world would one day live in Hayek's shadow, and no one had any idea what was coming. This is where the story of neoliberalism begins. Friedrich August von Hayek was born in Vienna, in what was then known as Austria-Hungary, in 1889. Hayek was born into a wealthy family of high academic achievement. Hayek's father, August von Hayek, was a medical doctor who worked for the Viennese Municipal Ministry of Health and was a part-time lecturer on botany at the University of Vienna. Hayek's mother, Felicitas von Jurashek, was born into a wealthy conservative and landowning family, and before Hayek was born, received a vast inheritance in the early years of her marriage to Hayek's father. Both of Hayek's grandfathers, Franz von Jurashek and Gustav Edler von Hayek, were scholars and lecturers as well. Jurashek was a leading economist in Austria and close friend of Eugene von Bumba-Werk, one of the foundational thinkers of the Austrian School of Economics. Gustav Edler taught natural science in Vienna for 30 years and wrote many works on biology. Hayek was also second cousin to the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. From an early age, Hayek was a precocious child surrounded by intellectual stimulation. He read philosophical works fluently before attending school. He was the oldest of three, with two younger brothers, but preferred to associate with adults. Hayek was deeply influenced by his father, who frequently suggested large volumes for him to read, and also piqued his interest in biology. Hayek spent many hours practicing botany with his father, and traveled extensively throughout Europe collecting natural specimens of plants, minerals, and insects. Hayek's preoccupation with botany also exposed him to Darwinian evolutionary theory from a young age. The ideas of survival of the fittest and of spontaneous evolutionary development were profoundly influential on his economic theories later in life. In 1917, Hayek enlisted in the Austro-Hungarian army and fought on the Italian front during World War I. He experienced combat as a telephone officer and as a spotter in military aircraft. It was actually during his military service that he was given his first books and pamphlets on economics by a fellow officer. He was especially influenced by the works of Walter Rathenau, who was actually a socialist planner. After suffering damage to his hearing in his left ear, he was decorated for bravery and discharged after a year of service in 1918. After leaving the army, he enrolled as a student at the University of Vienna, where his father had lectured. His experience in the war left him with ambitions of helping work towards a better world by becoming a university professor. As Hayek began his university studies, the world around him changed dramatically. The Hamburg dynasty of Austria-Hungary was no more, and was replaced by the new Republic of Austria, which only consisted of a small fraction of its previous population and territory. The Romanovs in Russia were executed, and the Soviet Union, along with eight other new states, came into existence. New borders crisscrossed all over the European continent. The free market gold standard system of international trade, on which classical liberalism flourished prior to World War I, was put on life support. In post-war Vienna, 
Marxism, common ownership of the means of production, welfare statism, and the planned economy achieved a sudden economic respectability, just as inflation had reached levels that no living European could remember. All of this only fueled Hayek's interest in economics, and brought his attention to the question which would concern him for the rest of his life. Was this socialist reform that was sprouting up all around him actually feasible? Though Hayek began his lifelong fascination with economics by reading socialist planning literature, the decisive influence for Hayek finally came from the liberal free market economic tradition of the Austrian School of Economics, located at the University of Vienna. A prestigious lineage of economic mentors and pupils, including Karl Menger, Eugene von Bumba Werk, Friedrich von Wieser, and Ludwig von Mises were Hayek's formative influences. Menger was the teacher of both Bumba Werk and Wieser, while Mises was subsequently a student of Bumba Werk. Hayek would learn from all four of these elder Austrian economists in different capacities throughout his life. Karl Menger is considered the most original thinker of the Austrian school of economics. Both Hayek and Mises, who are today themselves considered giants of the Austrian school, credit Karl Menger with almost single-handedly opening a new era in the history of economic thought with his book Principles of Economics, published in 1871. Hayek considered one of Menger's greatest contributions in principles to be his individualist or subjectivist approach, which located the focus of all economic activity in the actions, decisions, values, and knowledge of individuals. In 1883, Menger published another work, entitled Investigations into the Methods of the Social Sciences, with special reference to economics. In this work, Menger posed a question which Hayek considered one of the most pressing questions facing economics, if not all of the social sciences, which was, how can institutions which serve the common welfare emerge without a common will aiming at their creation? Menger insisted that it was an error to reduce all institutions to acts of positive common will, and that institutions were in fact unintended creations. Menger wrote, Natural organisms, almost without exception, exhibit, when closely observed, a really admirable functionality of all parts with respect to the whole, a functionality which is not, however, the result of human calculation, but of a natural process. Similarly, we can observe in numerous social institutions a strikingly apparent functionality with respect to the whole, but with closer consideration, they still do not prove to be the result of an intention aimed at this purpose, i.e. the result of an agreement of members of society. They, too, present themselves rather as natural products. Hayek derived an important insight from Menger's work. At a time when the socialists and Marxists of the day were insisting that economies needed to be deliberately planned and coordinated to achieve both prosperity and a just distribution of resources, Menger hinted that institutions like the government and the economy were simply not the result of coordination, but rather of a spontaneously generated sum of decisions by disconnected individuals acting in concert, which Hayek later likened to an unconscious process of evolution. The next two great influences on Hayek were Wieser and Bumba Werk, who were both students and colleagues of Menger at the University of Vienna. These two men were brothers-in-law and lifelong friends, and Bumba Werk, as we recall, was also a close friend of Hayek's maternal grandfather, Franz von Jeraschek. Bumba Werk was a steadfast adherent of Menger, and was the most well-known Austrian economist of the time thanks to his long career as a leading Austrian statesman. Bumbavark's face actually appeared on the 100 shilling banknote from 1984 until the euro was introduced in 2002. Bumbavark is notable for his early and explicit conflicts with Marxist economic thought. Each of Bumbavark's major economic works included criticisms of Marx, including Marx's exploitation theory and Marx's theory of labor value. Bumbavark and his successor's early skirmishes with Marxism established the Austrian school as a persistent adversary of socialism. Wieser, on the other hand, was a more unique figure in the Austrian school. Hayek mainly studied under Wieser and gravitated to many of Wieser's novel economic ideas. Wieser was both Hayek's professor and his thesis advisor for the majority of Hayek's time as a student in Vienna. But Wieser was just as large of a figure in the field of sociology as he was in economics, and his sociological training lent his ideas more sympathy to government intervention than Menger or certainly Bumba Werk. Wieser was a follower of the Fabian Society, a society of British socialists that included figures such as Beatrice and Sidney Webb, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Harold Lasky, and even the two major protagonists of British embedded liberalism, William Beveridge and Clement Attlee. As a student, Hayek was a disciple of Wieser, and mostly sympathetic to the idea of government involvement in the economy. Hayek recalled later in life that when he was a student, he was very much aware that there were two traditions in the Austrian school, the Bumba Werk tradition and the Wieser tradition. However, he added that Wieser was tainted with Fabian socialist sympathies. Hayek's last major influence, 
Ludwig von Mises, was, according to Hayek, his chief guide among all of his influences and was most certainly a follower of the Boom Bovark tradition. Mises is the most important of all of Hayek's influences for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was Mises who first shook Hayek's faith in government intervention with his book, Socialism, published in 1922. It was this work that shifted the trajectory of Hayek's thought away from the democratic socialism of Wieser and into the camp of the anti-socialist Boom Bavirk Austrians. In the early 1920s, Mises initiated what became known as the Socialist Calculation Debate, which was a theoretical assault on the practicality of a centrally planned economy. In his article from 1920, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, Mises argued that socialism could not rationally allocate resources in society due to the absence of market prices under a system of central planning. According to Mises, the absence of an exchange economy with private property, a competitive market, contract, and profit would mean that there would be no such thing as price, and therefore economic decision-making, both on the individual and governmental level, would be impossible. Mises's broadside then earned responses from prominent socialist thinkers of the time, such as Oscar Longa. Mises later extended these arguments in his book, Socialism, which Hayek said dashed his hopes that socialism would ever deliver a more rational, just world. Secondly, Mises was a crucial mentor and ally for Hayek early in his career and for the rest of his life. Shortly after Hayek's graduation in 1923, Mises hired Hayek as a specialist for the Austrian government on the recommendation of Hayek's former mentor, Wieser. In 1924, Hayek was hired to work as a research assistant for the American professor Jeremiah Jenks at New York University, whom Mises introduced Hayek to and who hired Hayek based on Mises's recommendation. After returning from New York, Hayek became a consistent attendee of Mises's Privat Seminar, an informal evening seminar devoted to discussion of high-level concepts in various fields of the social sciences. In 1927, Mises founded an economic research center in Austria on Hayek's advice, called the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research, and then hired Hayek as its first director. At every step of Hayek's early career, Mises was there, providing Hayek opportunities to build his professional experience and eventually make his entrance into academia. In 1929, the same year as the Wall Street crash and the advent of the Great Depression, Hayek became a privat dozen, or an unpaid lecturer, at the University of Vienna, where he previously studied. It was at this point in history that laissez-faire liberalism had arrived at its lowest point, and even self-identified classical liberals were beginning to understand that their economic and political vision was in serious need of rethinking. Though Hayek had finally gotten his foot in the door of academia, his time at the University of Vienna was short. Political conditions across the European continent were beginning to darken, as the Nazis began consolidating power in interwar Germany. Mises confided to Hayek and his other colleagues that he believed freedom in Austria would soon end. Thankfully for Hayek, his work would find the attention of sympathetic liberal economists at the London School of Economics, which would prove to be the stage for Hayek's true entrance into the world of academia. In 1931, the London School of Economics and Political Science, or LSE for short, was a leading institution of higher learning with a storied history known around the world. The school was founded in 1895 by Beatrice and Sidney Webb of the Fabian Society, the same socialist society that earned the respect of Hayek's early mentor, Friedrich Wieser. However, the school's Fabian roots didn't produce a singularly socialist or leftist institution. The LSE's influence across the range of economic thought was extensive. The LSE incubated the highly influential socialism of Harold Lasky, the post-war embedded liberalism of Beveridge and Attlee, and a revival of classical liberalism under Edward Cannon and Lionel Robbins simultaneously. It was this last faction of classical liberal holdouts, headed by Cannon and later Robbins, that would bring Hayek to London and help him make a name for himself. Hayek had previously made contact with Edwin Cannon through his work for the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research. Hayek recalled that Mises considered Cannon a kindred spirit, and Hayek was effusive in his praise for Cannon, who he said, safeguarded the main body of liberal thought through that eclipse in the intellectual history of liberalism, which lasted throughout the 15 or 20 years following the First World War. Cannon was a classical liberal in the tradition of Adam Smith, who placed emphasis on the slow transformation of communities. Cannon wrote, All important change is gradual, and social institutions are not created by the sudden efforts of inspired geniuses, but grow of themselves, usually slower than oak trees. It comes as no surprise that Cannon kept a portrait of Karl Menger hanging from the wall of his office at the LSE. Much like Hayek, Cannon was originally an ally of interventionists, but in the early 20th century, he moved sharply to the side of classical liberalism. Cannon was the main combatant in the long-standing rivalry between the economists of the LSE and those of Cambridge under the auspices of Alfred Marshall, the mentor of John Maynard Keynes. In 
Marshall had been the most influential economist in Britain for many years. Marshall's major work, ironically also titled Principles of Economics, but published 19 years after Manger's book of the same name, was the dominant economic textbook in England for decades. Marshall was one of the first economists to start taking economics to a more mathematically rigorous level, and also began to move economics away from its classical focus on the market economy, and instead popularized it as a study of human behavior. Cannon and Marshall had deep disagreements over the usefulness of pure theory and of economic history within the field of economics as a whole. When Cannon finally stepped down as the head of economics at the LSC in 1927, the distinguished American economist Alan Young was meant to replace him. But when Young died suddenly of pneumonia in 1929, the path was open for another man to become head of economics at LSC at the bright young age of only 30 years old. That man was Lionel Robbins, who would go on to not only revitalize classical liberal economics at LSE, but bring Hayek on board the LSE's economics faculty, where he would do battle against Keynes, Cambridge, and interventionist economics. Before Hayek entered the scene, Robbins had already been battling against Keynes on the Committee of Economists appointed in 1930 by Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald. The committee's task was to examine the origins of the Great Depression and recommend solutions. Keynes chaired the committee, leading to frequent clashes between Keynes and Robbins. In the end, Robbins refused to sign the final report, despite the fact that Keynes had originally recommended him for appointment to the committee in the first place. Robbins first heard of Hayek from an article Hayek had written entitled The Paradox of Saving, in which Hayek attacked the Keynesian notion that the British economy was suffering from excessive saving and not enough consumption. At a time when Keynesianism was rapidly gaining credibility, Robbins considered Hayek's article to be the thing that we need at the moment to fight Keynes. In January and February of 1931, Robbins invited Hayek to give four lectures at the LSE concerning the topics of his new book, Prices and Production, in contrast to an earlier lecture Hayek gave at Cambridge, which left the audience completely bewildered. The lectures at the LSE were extremely well received, and Hayek was quickly invited to become a professor at the LSE and to be featured in the LSE's scholarly journal, Economica. In May 1931, an English translation of The Paradox of Saving was published as the lead feature in Economica. The next issue, published in August, was a harshly critical review written by Hayek of Keynes's book, A Treatise on Money, and included an invitation for Keynes to respond in its closing paragraphs. This attack was the first that Keynes had ever heard of Hayek, and for Hayek to put himself on equal footing with Keynes was to raise his profile significantly. In the November edition, a devastating reply from Keynes and a second rebuttal from Hayek was published. In his response, Keynes called Hayek's prices and production one of the most frightful muddles I have ever read with scarcely a sound proposition in it, and an extraordinary example of how, starting with a mistake, a remorseless logician can end up in bedlam. Hayek was just as unsparing in his follow-up reply, writing, Unfortunately, Mr. Keynes's answers does not seem to me to clear up many of the difficulties I have pointed out. He replies chiefly by a sweeping accusation of confusion. I cannot believe Mr. Keynes wished to give the impression that he is trying to distract the attention of the reader from the objections which have been raised by abusing his opponent. The next year, in February 1932, the second part of Hayek's review of A Treatise on Money was published. For almost an entire year, Hayek dominated the pages of Economica by sparring directly with the most popular economists of the day. The feud was made public in October 1932, when Keynes and several other Cambridge economists sent a letter to the London Times suggesting public investment to fight the Depression. In response, Robbins, Hayek, and other LSE economists fired back, supporting the government's balanced budget policy. The main question at stake was whether government or private interests would be better at growing the British economy. Hayek and Robbins, of course, argued it was private interests who were superior, but at the time, Keynesianism was winning public opinion. Still, Hayek's exposure in Economica and the debate in the pages of British newspapers established a place for Hayek in British academia. By this time, Hayek had come to be seen as Robbins' point man for intellectual combat with Cambridge. With their heightened notoriety, Robbins and Hayek launched a joint economic seminar led by the two of them together that would become enormously popular at the LSE in the early and mid-1930s. The economics department that Robbins and Hayek built together became, in Hayek's words, probably the most important center of the new liberalism. The LSE attracted visiting economists from all around the world, including fellow Austrians Gottfried Haberler and Fritz Matschlup from Vienna, and the Americans Frank Knight and Jacob Viner from Chicago. During his heyday at the LSE, Hayek began an intellectual transition from technical economic theory, which had been the primary focus of his career up until then, to broader fields of political philosophy. His first foray into this new mode of thought was a condensed collection of the socialist calculation debate begun by Mises a decade earlier, 
which he published as Collectivist Economic Planning in 1935. In the process of explaining the socialist calculation problem to an English-speaking audience, Hayek began to think harder about the methodologies of the social sciences that Manger and Cannon had been criticizing years ago. He was still seeking the answer to the question of how to create a society of order in which no one is actually coerced or directed by a central authority. No one knew it at the time, but Hayek was actually on the cusp of formulating one of the most powerful ideas of any academic field to ever be put to paper, the concept of spontaneous order in a competitive economy. In 1936, the same year as Keynes' own magnum opus, The General Theory, Hayek published a small article entitled Economics and Knowledge. In this work, Hayek articulated the million-dollar question that had dogged him for so many years. Hayek wrote, How can the combination of fragments of knowledge existing in different minds bring about results which, if they were to be brought about deliberately, would require a knowledge on the part of the directing mind which no single person can possess? To show that in this sense the spontaneous actions of individuals will, under conditions which we can define, bring about a distribution of resources which can be understood as if it were made according to a single plan, although nobody has planned it, seems to me indeed an answer to the problem which has sometimes been metaphorically described as that of the social mind. Though Hayek wouldn't pose the direct answer to this question until 1945 in another groundbreaking article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, he was beginning to perceive the whole of economics through a brand new light. Hayek realized that the price mechanism in a competitive market society was an incredibly powerful tool for spreading accurate information. Hayek's idea was that a free market economy was like an unconscious mind that could synthesize and transmit information about price and value faster and more efficiently than any other economic system, but especially a centrally planned socialist economy. As long as there was a strong state to enforce laws in which rational, utility-maximizing individuals enjoyed the freedom to contribute their dispersed fragments of information to the market through buying and selling, liberty and prosperity would be maximized. The undirected free market would process more information than any central planning board could ever dream of, and any government intervention would only distort these price signals and disturb the otherwise perfect ecosystem of a free market society. Hayek had begun to explain how free market economies were not just places where commerce took place, they were the mechanisms that allowed the institutions of society to organize themselves without the coercion of a central authority. This was an accomplishment that built on and surpassed the theories of Manger, Cannon, and Mises, and Hayek posed his idea as the solution to the limits of human knowledge in a complex economy, and why economies that permitted government intervention literally could not deliver the goods. But the prominence that the LSE enjoyed earlier in the 1930s didn't last forever. By the end of the decade, almost all of those who had been in Hayek's camp had shifted to Keynes. The role of active governments in the management of recessions and depressions became accepted as a common fact. The New Deal policies in the United States were well underway. Keynesianism was about to reach the height of its influence over liberal democracy, while Hayek's audience had dispersed. The world was passing over Hayek and his grand idea, an idea that would one day return to rule the world. Classical liberalism, laissez-faire capitalism, and the global gold standard trading system were now in political freefall. The ideas of government intervention in the economy, whether Keynesian or Marxist, were spreading and finding support all over the world. For those opposed to such policies, these were lonely times indeed, and the thinkers and business leaders who remained loyal to free market capitalism were forced to reach out to one another with a sense of urgency. They had to come together and do something to rehabilitate liberalism and combat the appeal of interventionism. In 1938, one of the first major attempts of a rehabilitation of this kind was attempted in Paris at a gathering called the Colloque Walter Lippmann. The event was a discussion of the book The Good Society by the American journalist Walter Lippmann and was organized by the French philosopher Louis Rougier. The participants of this conference included Hayek and Mises, along with a host of other German and French liberals. Most notably, they included Alexander Rousteau and Wilhelm Rapke, two German economists associated with the University of Freiburg and who were foundational thinkers of the school of ordo-liberalism, a tangential offshoot of neoliberalism which would later birth the social market economy that rejuvenated West Germany after World War II. It was at this gathering of concerned liberal thinkers that the term neoliberalism was first coined by Rousteau. However, far from being a monolithic consensus, there were plenty of divergences in thought about what this new liberalism ought to look like. Was freedom an end in itself, or merely a means? Is liberalism a rigorous application of economic laws, or merely an ideology? Does liberalism have to take into account the provision of social security or not? On these issues there was a clear divide. One side, headed by Rougier, Rousteau, and Rock, admitted the need to evolve past the shortcomings of laissez-faire liberalism which had led to the Great Depression. The other, advocated by Hayek and Mises, 
set out to define a liberalism that simply paired a free market liberal order with a strong state that reinforced competition. On this disagreement, Rousseau went straight to the point. It is undeniable that here, in our circle, two different points of view are represented. Those who do not find anything essential to be criticized or to change with traditional liberalism, and we, the others, who are seeking the responsibility for the decline of liberalism in liberalism itself, and consequently, are seeking the solution in a fundamental renewal of liberalism. Though Rousteau was courteous in public, in private, he told his colleague Ropke what he really thought of Hayek and Mises. They were relics, and it was liberals of their stripe who had caused the crises of liberal capitalism of the 20th century. Nevertheless, there was a unified agenda produced by the colloque Walter Lippmann that gives us one of the earliest rudimentary definitions of neoliberalism in history. The use of the price mechanism as the best way to obtain the maximal satisfaction of human expectations, the responsibility of the state for instituting a juridical framework adjusted to the order defined by the market, the possibility for the state to follow goals other than short-term expedience and to further them by levying taxes, and the acceptance of state intervention if it does not favor any particular group and seeks to act upon the causes of the economic difficulties. That might sound like a slightly more reasonable version of neoliberalism than you may have expected, but this conception of neoliberalism was not to last. As it turns out, the year 1938 was a terrible year to attempt to couple together an international movement across the European continent, because by the very next year, Nazi Germany would invade Poland and ignite the Second World War. After the start of the war, the participants of the Kolok Walter Lippmann were scattered across Europe, and the early neoliberal movement as a whole quickly went quiet. Individual activists such as Hayek and Mises were forced to keep up the fight in whatever capacity they could, even as they were forced out of their homes. Mises was forced to emigrate from his native Austria to New York. For Hayek, this meant relocating the campus of the London School of Economics directly into the layer of his ideological nemesis, Keynes and Cambridge. But the neoliberal movement wasn't out for good. Hayek used these war years in Cambridge to continue exploring political philosophy, refining his ideas on the division of knowledge, sharpening his critique of socialism, and then began drafting the book that would finally end his obscurity as an academic and a political thinker forever. That book was called The Road to Serfdom, and in the next episode, we'll follow Hayek's time at Cambridge, analyze The Road to Serfdom and its publication, and then document Hayek's organization of the Mont Pelerin Society, which finally gave modern neoliberalism its origin. But before any of this could happen, the Second World War would set the world on fire and set the stage for one of the greatest economic paradigm shifts in human history, the first deliberate re-embedding of markets into Keynesian liberalism.